Hey, how's it going? I'm Nick, the host of the Echo Academy podcast, a podcast where we tap into the world's collective wisdom and experience to learn how we can be more resilient. In this episode, I speak with life and performance coach Matthew Gerardo on what making a good decision really means, and more importantly, how to make a good decision. What I loved about my conversation with Matthew was that we traversed through moral, ethical, and philosophical points when discussing the topic of making good decisions. You probably already know that our decisions are formed based on the limited information we have and the biases we hold. So by definition, there is no guarantee of a good decision. And even if we do make a good decision, it doesn't guarantee the outcome that we're looking for. So what Matthew and I sought to discover through our conversation was how to make a decision where regardless of the outcome, we can feel proud of ourselves and more importantly, feel motivated enough to keep on pursuing what it is we're in search of. After all, I think that is realistically the only thing we can control. I think this episode will open your eyes to a more realistic way of thinking about the pursuit of your goals. So, without further ado, here's my conversation with Matthew Gerardo. You asked me, okay, what one of the questions you said, oh, you might want to think about is what makes a good a good decision. Yeah. And I thought about that a lot and I, I listened to a lot of people and read about it to just try and think it's and it's it's a lot of to do with your process for decision making. You know, many people will you ask them what is good decision and say the one that gets me closest to my ideal state or, and we focus on the outcome. But actually the decision making, good decision making is born out of the process. Is it thoughtful? Are you deliberate? Are you considering all the relevant factors? Right? Are you um, um, thinking about it in light of your own principles? When you make that decision, are you going to be able to live with yourself? Right? There's all this intentionality behind it. right? So when it comes to that, when you're considering a purchase, when you're considering doing something, uh, whatever it is, well, okay, if you don't think about it, you don't spend time thinking about it, you don't think about the possibilities, you don't ask yourself why it says 100% or what that means, right? then you're not going to make the optimal decision. Right? There's a chance you could make a good decision, right? Um, but are you going to make an optimal one? The chances are lower. Okay, so somebody has kind of given you some erroneous information, tried to kind of influence you in a certain direction. But hey, maybe you should shoulder some of the blame in some of these cases. And, you know, that's uh, part of decision making. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I, I suppose it is our responsibility. And, you know, you mentioned that what makes a good decision is your intention, the values, and you know how mindful you are of them. Uh, but I mean, I suppose that is reflected in the goal that you have as well, right? Because you're always thinking, how do I get to that goal? So in the end, doesn't so the so so let me clarify. I think the outcome that you want to achieve sets the direction, right? Um, and, and but where you can optimize or increase your chance, see. So, so the outcome sets your direction. The way you optimize the decision to make the right decision and how to get to that outcome, that's the process part. And, and why is there a distinction? Because there are many variables that will come into play. Typically, the results of a decision um, from when the decision is made, there is a delay, right? Right. You say, I, I don't know, you, you're a company and you decide to make a change to pricing. Right? You, at the time, you could consider all the relevant factors. You can ask different opinions. You can look at the trends in the market and make a change, right? And it could be a really good decision given everything you know at the time. Right. But six months down the line, when you start to see the results, the results are not what you wanted. And it's not what you wanted. 
not necessarily because you made a bad decision, but because things have changed or new variables have come into play or new information has come to light, right? Yeah. And that's, that's different. So the outcome sets the direction. A good decision, though, is more about, at least in my opinion, is more about the process you take to get there. And I, again, I draw a parallel for you. Um, I do a lot of coaching in peak performance and so on, right? And when you think of this in relation to something like an athlete, right? You want the athlete to perform at its best on game day, on at race day, right? That's what you're aiming for. But you don't tell the athlete, okay, go and do your best on game day. <laughs> They're not going to just, not just go, oh yeah, okay, let me turn it on. Because on game day, they might wake up on the wrong side of the bed and they're out of it, right? So where do you increase their performance or increase their chances of performing well? Because that's what you're doing, increasing the chances of getting the outcome. In this case, the peak performance in the ultimate race. You do it in the preparation, the process of preparing, right? You put in 100% effort every day. You create drills that work on um, what they're good at or what then to mitigate what they're not good at. You practice, you tweak things. But that preparation process, every single day, you go in through it methodically, thoroughly, and with as much effort as you possibly can so that when uh, race day comes, irrespective of all the other variables that might happen that you're not expecting, you're ready to perform, you're prepared for yeah. it. And a decision is the same thing. You think about the outcomes, you know what level you want to hit, you know what results you want. But it's the process and the the quality of your decision-making process that's going to determine how likely you are. All you can do is stack the odds in your favor, right? And that's never going to be 100% perfect, but you can stack them. And that is the process of decision-making. Right. Then it's your chances of achieving your outcomes are higher. Right. So so it's almost like the preparation to make good decisions matter more than than I would say previous experiences. Would that be fair to say? Um so there's a place for both. So here how should I put it? Um I think previous experiences might inform your system. So you, you want to create a system for yourself, a process for yourself, a framework for whatever you want to call it, for making the decision. Your experiences might inform what that framework is like. It might help you evolve that framework over time. That's fine. Um, when it's an important decision or when it's a complex decision or the consequences of a decision are greater, you want to give yourself time to go through this process. That's That's one. But what you're alluding to here, I guess, is where is the role of intuition in all this, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, a little bit of that gut feeling. Yeah, and, and so I read something really interesting. I heard it in an interview, I think it was. It was like, intuition is precognition. It's your mind remembering previous experiences and taking a shortcut to make a decision and actually i we started off by talking about some of these cognitive biases yeah and uh, one of the biggest researchers in all this is daniel kahneman yes yeah, I'm aware. nobel laureate and all that um he was asked um and he's the guy i stole the idea of precognition intuition is precognition <laughs> from to be fair um but it, he was asked okay you've done all this research um and you know all about these biases have you improved your life your decision making his answer to that was no. He said, I'm still as terrible. He says, there's a trade-off, right? Certain decisions, you don't need to go through this methodical process. You don't need to kind of think about it and wonder what are the consequences and what's going to happen if this happens. And I do I need to consider all the factors? If you're under threat, you're going to run or you're going to freeze or, you know, and that's your intuition kicking in. You know, can yeah. I get away from this or should I stop? You know, you don't want to stand there going, hmm, guy is coming at me with a knife. Hmm, let me consider all the factors. Right. right? By yeah. the time you've done the... Pr so intuition has almost... Im the way I see it is there's a time and a place for intuition. And there's a trade-off. There's energy and effort that goes into making a more a decision. How much energy and effort do you want to put into that? Yeah. Do you want to spend an hour thinking about what you're going to eat this evening? Probably not, unless you're a foodie, in which yeah. case you might want to spend three hours on it. Right, <laughs> right. right. Um, but but if you're like me, who's not a big eater, you might say, well, you know, whatever. 
Yeah. Go to McDonald's. It's down the road. Don't even think about it. Yeah. Right. Um, there's a trade-off. I think that's that's intuition has its place, but it depends on what's the decision being made. Right. Right. Um, and if it's an important decision, a complex one, or one with consequences, I come back. Your outcomes or a good decision will be determined by what process you take. Right. And I, I, when I hear you, when I hear you talk about this, um, you know, especially about how you know your gut feeling and your intuition is precognition. I don't know why I start to think of uh, Formula One drivers, you know, as an, a great example of this, you know, because there's a lot of preparation that goes into, yeah. into you know, before race day even. But then when race day comes, you know, there are certain things that require intuition in terms of knowing, you know, <laughs> how the person is coming from behind you, if how he plans to overtake these things. You they know, happen in milliseconds. Yeah, right? exactly. It's, like gotta... it's too fast for you to be preparing for it. It's really gut and intuition, and I think that's. It seems like that's what you're alluding elu- to. You know, it's um, it's almost the speed at which you need to make these decisions, kind of. Which comes back to the preparation piece. I mean, if I if I take this, it's, and I think it was, it's it's probably been covered in a lot of places. But there's another good book, Tim Galway, I think. It's called The Inner Game of Tennis. It's easy Not read. It. It's, yeah. it's very good. Um, and he talks about two selves, the self one and self two. And basically, it's the conscious and unconscious mind. And so when it comes to sports, when you are performing on game day, you want yourself two to take control. So what's, what's happening? Your self one is kind of this conscious part of your brain that's saying you should do this, practice this, and it's it's dictating. It's that confident kid in class, right? Right. Self two is that kind of fat kid in class who's a little bit less confident. I, I Probably unfair to all fat kids because it's probably some confident. <laughs> so, yeah, of anyway, course. Yeah. And fat is not important, but it's the less confident kid, right? Yes. Um, Self too has this wonderful memory, remembers absolutely everything it has ever learned in its life. And once it knows it, it can repeat it in a second, right? Or in a millisecond. Self one kind of interprets this. And so what you've got is this ongoing dialogue, right? But what what he explores in his book is very much you practice to such an extent that everything you do, all of the key activities are ingrained in this self too. And then when you get to game day, you get to the race, you form a, you don't have to think about it. You just let go and you trust that self too knows what it's doing. Right. Right. And it will remember in a second. And if, if your preparation and your system for preparing is optimized and it's followed properly and executed well, then the odds are that the self too will know exactly what to do at exactly what time. And so when you get into Formula One race and that guy is about to overtake, you know what position you need to take. Yeah. Right? And that's that's what's going on. And, and I think drawing it back to, to decision making, it's a similar thing. The more you practice your system, your framework, the more it gets ingrained in this part of your unconscious. So you'll get to a stage where you don't really need to take so much time to think about it this year because you know it so well. You know what you need to consider. What are the different factors? And very often you see with people when they say, when you ask them, how did you do that? How do you know? They say, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so it's because that system is ingrained in them. Right. But to make it better, you've got to kind of take it out, fix it, tweak it, make it better, yeah. try again. Yeah. Um, so it's, 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 it's interesting you brought up that book. Um, the, and, and I was actually speaking to a previous guest of mine. I just, I just had a conversation with him earlier this week. Um, and he's a tennis psychologist. Okay. So, so what he, what he does is basically try to train the mental aspect of tennis players. And he's brought a few people to, okay. uh, to like, Grand Slam titles and Wimbledon yeah, and stuff. It's very cool. Yes, yeah. And I I was I was in awe because he says, you know, people people pay too much attention to this idea of, you know, like mental preparation and 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 mental strength and mental resilience comes from, you know, like daily discipline. Mm-hmm. But he says like the most important thing that sets like the top players apart from anyone else is the ability for 
for them to put their mental preparation and and whatever whatever sort of preparation they have from their conscious mind to their subconscious because eighty <coughs> percent of our brain uh, works on the subconscious and only like twenty percent is on the conscious mind. So if you want to if you want to really excel, then you need to make sure that the part of your brain that functions the best holds the key to your tennis excellence. And I and and for me that was that was really mind blowing, right? Because I think that's something that isn't really spoken about correct you know we always talk about oh you know focus on your discipline your you know your mental preparation but all of it is focused on the conscious mind and you know see because again the way i see it and i mean there's a couple of things i'd love to say on that but it's we're focused on the outcome you know you, you i again i talk about peak performance i talk about outcomes results that's what we're looking at decision making people will say i want to you know, I'm making decisions because I want to get more sales. Okay. But that doesn't make a good decision. Right? It's 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 the process. You want to kind of in, ingrain it, yeah. right, um, into your head so that you don't have to think about it. You're stacking the odds in your favor. Um, the interesting part is that for what he's saying about moving it to the subconscious, the other part is once it's in your subconscious, how do you fix it? Right, and so then, for a top performer, it's the ability to take what's ingrained in the subconscious, pull it back out into the conscious, tweak it, improve, improve it, and then push it back into the subconscious. Yep. And this whole cycle of ongoing um, uh, kind of improvement, self improvement, plays a big part. In yeah, this. I think I think you kind of hit the nail on on the head with that. Like in terms of self improvement really is the ability to to ingrain it in your i mean we're just, we're using the analogy of the subconscious of course yeah. but it's ingraining it in the subconscious but being able to take it back out you know consciously fix it improve it and then put it back in where so that it becomes autopilot again yeah and and here's one of the tricks of of that or one of the difficulties is it to do it without judgment the ability to think about things objectively especially uh, decision making in general but but anything to do with performance you take you look at your performance in the formula one race and you say you can you can say two things you know you can say i was shit right that was really bad i'm i'm a loser i knew i was a loser you know because i didn't turn at the right time or you can say i didn't turn at the right time why didn't i turn at the right time what was missing why should i have turned at the right time was there an alternative it's a very different kind of self-talk and you can do that in a uh, in a lot of contexts, but that forms the basis of being able to kind of look at yourself and say, okay, how can I do that better? What do I need to work on? And it's not that easy. I think a lot of people will kind of judge themselves harshly and the conscious mind will start saying, right, you're a loser, <laughs> subconscious. Yeah, You don't know how to do anything. And subconscious, yeah. what's it going to do? Just sit there and kind of and get agree, quiet. Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah <I> agree. <laughs> exactly. You know, and the more that it's said, the more it's ingrained. Yeah. So now you're ingrained in that belief that you're a loser. Yeah. And so it's not true. So it's this whole constant cycle of kind of ingrain it, pull it out, tweak it, put it back in. Um, yeah. Wow, well, fascinating. I think it's, you're, you're right. I mean, self-conscious, uh, I mean, sorry, being more self-compassionate and, and, you know, removing that judgment really plays into improving your, I mean, if nothing else, your your, your performance. Yeah, say. exactly. I think I think with um, um, with decisions, our decisions can often. I think, and this is one of the the dangers that we respond. We don't respond to what is actually happening. We respond to our interpretation of what is happening. That means that. We can trick our intuition. So if we're emotional about something, we can cloud our judgment, right? And so if we don't have a system that's well thought out, that's well structured, that tells us you need to consider different perspectives, that we need to look at it objectively, then what are we doing? We'll we'll look at the facts, we'll interpret it whatever way we want, right? Clouded by 
a strong emotion potentially, which is fair. You should have emotions. You shouldn't. That should be part of your process, right? right? But you should. But then you're not going to make the optimal decision, or you're not certain you're going to make an optimal decision. And so the the trick would be to say, yes, I'm emotional. Let me judge it. Let me let me be angry at this. Yeah. Right. Let me swear. Yeah. Let me kind of curse someone. But let me also be consciously aware that I am emotional about this. And let me take a moment to stop. And maybe it's not in me at that point in time or even later to remove the emotion. So how can I work it into my system? How can I uh, work a safeguard into my system? Is it that I ask a second opinion, a friend that I trust to give their opinion on this situation? Do I go to a completely independent person and say, what do you think? What's your interpretation of this? See what you might be missing out. Yeah, and I think that's that's an important factor. I think one of the things that maybe took me a while to to understand that actually we're not responding to what actually is. Most of the time, we're responding to our interpretation of what is. Yeah, and that leads to, in many cases, below par decisions. Yeah. And so you have to be very conscious about that and very intentional about saying, okay, what is going on objectively? Right? Yeah. Are they really angry at me? You know? You know, where they or is something else going on? Let me take a step back and that's that. So you can make better decisions in my opinion. When yeah. you're conscious of that. And you, you spoke about it a little bit, you know, through through our conversation thus far, but what do you think makes us make bad decisions, you know? Um, so if I, there's probably several things. I mean, if I, if I took the, the definition that I gave before, I, I, I think maybe not taking the time to think about something, not uh, doing our homework and thinking about what are all the relevant factors? You can't get them all, but at least take enough that you can triangulate yeah. somehow. Um, I think one of the interesting ones maybe is is not being clear on what your principles are. What does that mean? Um, I think uh, one of the things I mentioned before, I think good decision is a decision that you can also live with yourself. And, and you spoke about all the moral and ethical side of things, but knowing who you are and knowing what's acceptable to you and knowing what is your own guiding light in terms of your own personal principles actually plays a part in what a good decision is, right? It might mean that your decision might be slightly different to my decision, but actually being clear on on your own principles and your own values allows you to make a judgment on a certain situation. It allows you to know whether you are um, judging someone too harshly. It allows you to know whether your decision is potentially biased in any way, right? It also allows you to make a decision that you're comfortable with, right? If a core principle of mine is to treat everyone fairly, well, hey, that should be worked in. If I'm doing something that's not treating someone fairly, I'm not going to be comfortable with that. You know what? Maybe it'll gain sales, but maybe I won't be able to live with it because it's not. So I think when you're not clear on what that is, it makes things a little bit more ambiguous and it makes a little thing things a little bit harder to to make a judgment call and to make that decision. Um, yeah, that that's that's what I mean about that. That's a that's a really good point, you know. And I'm trying to. To bring in an example for my from from my personal life, I suppose. I mean, one of the one of the things I suppose I'm not clear about is, I mean, I, I I'm conscious about my health, but then my eating habits are always really bad, you know. So, mm -hmm. okay. you know, you know, I eat a lot of fast food, and 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 it's it's almost like it's a it's it's a form of comfort for me. It's comfort food, and so it's every time I'm feeling stressed or or stuff like that, I, that's like my default. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I. I do try to commit myself to being more healthy. So like that, for me, I think of that as maybe not being clear on my principles either because I know what the right decision is, but yet I can't seem to make it. And the I, question there is then, 
why do you want to what is your really motivating you to try and lead a healthier life what is it you want to do why do you enjoy eating these unhealthy foods what is it is it convenience you know for me for, for me it's like a mcdonald's is convenience i don't have to think about it um everything is equally good or bad whatever yeah. way you want to look at it yeah. it's just all yeah. the same yeah um it's quick so i can just walk in do it so for me it's it's no hassle yeah that's what it means to me and i'm a guy who you know i i don't want any hassle in my life yeah so it's easy to make that choice if i want to get healthy and stop eating that then it's not about stopping it's about how do i make eating healthier less hassle me. right or how do i make eating unhealthy more complicated for me <laughs> it's more hassle yeah. because i'm not going to do it if it's more hassle yeah right if mcdonald's all of a sudden said you're going to have to fill in six forms before you can choose it i'm gonna i'm never going to mcdonald's again yeah because it's too much hassle right um different uh things I, I think yeah knowing why you're doing something comes back to your, your principles why do you do it do you like it do you, is it a means of socializing and then I guess it comes to this idea of self-awareness, knowing who you are. Then you can frame other things in a way that work for you, right? So you want to eat healthy and you're a socialite. Well, join a group that eats healthy and go for dinners with them. Then it'll feed your socialite side and that will be your driving force for meeting with this group and it just so happens this group just eats healthy. Yeah. You just frame it. You you frame solutions in a different way and, and you can do a similar thing with decision-making. How can yeah. you frame it? What are my principles? I will not compromise on these things. Therefore, my decisions have to align yeah. to that. And that's how you 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 go through it. Right. right? Um, that's, yeah. that's such a good point because for me, the way, I mean, I love McDonald's too, you know, and uh, ooh, I mean, it's, it's convenient. It's comfort for me too. But also I think it's just... It's hassle-free, you're right, you know, like I really don't have to think, you know, and one thing that really bothers me when people ask, you know, what should we eat, you know, where should we go? And that is like one thing that was one of my pet peeves. It, it annoys me. And like, that people are deliberating over. Yeah, it's like, like choose the easiest. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I think, I yeah. So I think maybe that's how I should be thinking of it. And thanks for that. Like. Maybe I should be thinking, how do I make it hassle-free, you know, healthy? So here's the thing I learned about this, because you start to touch on things like habits and yeah. routines and stuff. One of the greatest lessons I learned about it is typically your habits are easy to do. So if you have bad things that you're doing repeatedly, tend to be very easy to do. So if you watch TV, Right? And you kind of just sit, kind of get home, sit down and kind of turn on the TV. Typically, the remote control is within reach, right? Sofa is just next to it. It's just everything's easy. What happens if you lock the remote control in a safe? <laughs> and every time you want to open that safe, you have to call up your, your, your helper or your mom to say, what's the code again? Yeah. Guarantee you the amount of TV you watch will go down. Right? right, because you're not going to call your mom all the time to ask for a code. You're not going to ask your helper for a code. You know, you're probably not even going to ask them to do it. <laughs> yeah. Right, but if it's in there, it becomes really hard. Now you flip it around. What habits do you want to create? Um, I definitely want to create more healthy habits, um, okay. specifically around um, exercise and 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 eating healthy. And the reason. F- for that at least is because you know i i right now i'm in a a long distance marriage right you know while we wait for the visas and stuff like that and i start to realize how precious time is time with you know with with my wife essentially absolutely so I, i feel like i need to be a bit more responsible and try to prolong my life as long as i can so that we can spend that much time together but on the flip side i'm like mcdonald's is right there <laughs> hey you could spend time together with mcdonald's oh no she hates it she, <laughs> she hates it yes. <laughs> well, there you go. No, so the, the question then becomes is of those healthy habits that you want to create why are they so difficult to get off the ground how can you make it easier mm. right so for example a simple thing is like you get home 
right? What's the first thing you do when you get home? I don't know. For, for me, typically I put down my bag, my glasses on. I probably walk to the kitchen, get a drink. You yeah. know, and then maybe I go upstairs and I sit at my desk. Now, if I change that and I walk in the door and the first thing I do is put on my running shoes and my jogging gear, now I'm dressed. Right? Yeah. If my, but make it even easier. I prepare my jogging gear and I leave it kind of outside in a place that I'll look immediately. Right? Now it's all ready. So all I have to do is put it on. Yeah. And if then you take it to the next level and you s associate that with every time you walk in the door, every time you walk in the door, you put on your gear. Yeah. Now you start to create the habit. It's, it's easier. So the night before you, so now you know. So the night before you, uh, you go to sleep, the next day you want to go to the gym, you prepare your running gear, put it all out yeah. so it's within reach. As soon as you get home, put on your gear. Right. Same thing. And you just repeat and it becomes easier and there's no hassle. Yeah. I I'll tell you, and one of the things I find challenging about that specifically is, and I'll give you a great example of this, like during Circuit Breaker, during the lockdown, mm -hmm. oh, wow, it, it was it was a real transformation for me because we were working at home. Uh, there was not much, uh, there was no going to the office, office and yeah. stuff like that, right? <clears throat> and I thought, okay, you know, now is the best time to go for a run and stuff like that. So what I did was I... At the start of Circuit Breaker, my my or lockdown, my stamina was terrible. So what I did was I just went for a long one hour walk. Okay. But eventually, over time, it became a one hour run, and then I started to 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 increase the distance. So what was the routine? Um, after work at six, go for okay. a run. What would happen? What specifically did you do? Um. I can't remember. I mean, I would just like, just put on my socks and, uh, okay. and shoes and so just how go. How about now? So that's the thing, right? So now it's different because now I come back home and I'm feeling exhausted. So I don't, I, I lose that momentum. Whereas, you know, previously I was like so easy. I can just like, I don't feel as tired and I'm like, okay, I'm ready to go. But now when I come back, I'm like, I don't feel like doing this. Easy. Yeah. Right. Get up, walk over to your cupboard, put on your clothes, step out. You're done. Yeah. Now it's, Finish work, get home, sort your things out, go put on your clothes. So it's like two more steps. Yeah. Right? And those two more steps are pain. But what if, I don't know, you run from here to home? Yeah. So you prepared your gym equipment and you put it right underneath your desk. The moment you kind of finish up, put on your clothes and run home. Yeah, that's that's what I what I've been trying to do, but it's it's still different because it's, it's the different. it's the I would say it's the le, le, the lethargy of 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 work in an office, I suppose you know, and it, energy drains faster than it, I suppose if I was at home, you know, I don't know for whatever for whatever reason, yeah. right? So I think that's for me is the challenge, and and don't don't get me wrong, I'm not in search of answers or like, like no, looking, no. Or, or trying to find an excuse, but I'm trying to. To show the difference, so that it maybe can help inform like how we can yeah, talk and about. Yeah, and it. I think there is there is there's got to be a combination of things, right? There's got to be a certain process of doing things, but there's also got to be a strong willingness to do it, right? Um, I think that's that's a given. Um, but with routines, it typically comes down to okay, how do you make it easy if it's a routine you want to do? good routine or good habit it's how do you make it easy right how do you um, create a system that is logical and simple and how do you create a trigger to make it just happen right? um, the same way as you see the remote you turn on the tv looking at the remote is a trigger right same thing walking in the front door could be a trigger whatever putting on your shoes could be a trigger something simple something easy and then you start yeah, you start those routines. So I, I don't know where we've, how we've got to this point. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think all of this. I mean, I it's a na it's a natural progression of any conversation like this, right? Because in terms of making good decisions, require a lot of good habits too, and you know, good training, and like you say, like good values, and 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 like a essentially a north star. Yeah. So and. and and for me, I, I would say 
making sometimes i would even question the 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 term good or bad decisions you know it's a decision, it's a decision and whether you can live with the consequence of that decision and that's and i think that's why i come to the point of it's the process yeah you can have a good or a bad process the outcome of the decision you know you can increase your chances of getting the outcome you want but there will be many variables that will come into play that you may not have considered or that might catch you by surprise right take a holiday decide you're going to go for a drive and it's you're going to drive to i don't know you're going to drive to thailand and it's going to be experience of a lifetime for you and your your partner you get to Johor Bahru and your car breaks down. Right. Yeah. Never predicted. You fix it, you keep on going, and then there are floods. And it be- turns into a nightmare. Decision was still a good one. Right. I mean, what? Maybe back to your point, was it good or bad? No, it was a decision. Yeah. Right. It was an informed decision that both of you would like it. It would be a fun thing to make a trip to Thailand. It would be great. So many good reasons why you took that decision. Right. Could you have predicted that? car was going to break down and that the rain was going to, maybe not. Right? right. But was your process good? Maybe your process, hopefully your process was good. Yeah. That's a, and that's the thing. This is why I come back with decisions. You're right. Maybe it's, there's no such thing as a good or bad decision. It's just a decision, but I do believe there's a good process. Yeah. And that is the key. And if you can ingrain that process into yourself, it can become intuition. Yeah. If we come back to the idea of precognition. Yeah. Um, and so these things. Um, I'm thinking something just, you, you asked about, okay, what makes it bad? Uh, what makes us uh, make bad decisions? Or yeah. uh, and, it, and I've connected several dots, but I've gone into, okay, like these, these, like these, these irrational uh, biases that we have. And I was thinking about it. One of my favorite cognitive biases is... Uh, peak end bias the peak end rule I don't, you heard know, of that? I don't know what that uh, is and it works a treat I've been using it f- forever the peak end rule basically states that the thing that people remember the most or the only thing they're likely to remember is the most intense moment of an experience or the last moment of an experience right the peak or the end right so you go on holiday right and you have enjoyed yourself, you know, a beach holiday, and it's been an okay holiday. But at the end, right, the manager of the hotel comes to you and says, come and have a dinner at my villa and do, take you for a boat ride on the... And you remember that. Yeah. Right? Or, or let's take it worse. It's, it's a poor holiday, but the last day the manager does that for you and says, you know what, I'm going to give you a night free and you're going to best holiday ever. <laughs> yeah. But you've forgotten very quickly that everything else was poor, right? Yeah. Or at some point in between, you go to your room and pipe bursts, right? And all these insects are rushing out of the pipes and it's you're just scared of these insects and you freak out. The whole holiday could have been amazing, but for that one moment, worst holiday ever. Yeah. Right? And so this is the idea of peak end rule and it's, it's an interesting one because you can apply it so easily. So let's say this podcast... Right? You're doing this episode. If you can manage it so that you end on a high note, right? Then people will remember the episode fondly. Right. Because that's what they will remember. If you can hit one really, if the intensity is in one positive note, people will go, that was a good episode. Even if the rest of it was really boring, 60 minutes, 59 minutes of pure boredom, <laughs> but there's one experience from this guy which you go whoa that's mind-blowing excellent episode yeah right and it's it's i i love that because it's uh it can derail your decision making if you're not conscious about it but it's so easy to put into into practice yeah you know it's, and I, I i i'll be honest i mean in my coaching sessions i make sure to end on a, a good note so the person leaves satisfied yeah um you can do it in sales meetings you know crack a joke you know this i like that yeah. Even if the rest of it was <laughs> um, one of my favorite ones, to be honest. I th- I That's really wonderful because it, for me, it kind of symbolizes how simple we are as people, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, 
and how much we can actually control. We, there's so much we can't control, but if we can find a positive peak experience or positive ending, then really what more can we ask for? Because then our memories are nothing but wonderful. The funds, yeah. And, yeah. And, and that's true. And uh, yeah, it's true. You can, you can manage those situations. And you could argue again, are you manipulating? Um, fine line between manipulating and influencing. And yeah. Kind of, um, but yeah, it's, I mean, there's so many things. You've, you mentioned now the question of control. Yeah. There's so much that you can't control. The question is, do you want to control everything? Not me. <laughs> no, it's it's this this search for control is a source of so much anxiety and stress. And then let me bring it back to decisions. You know, one of the things you have to accept is that the power to make a decision might not lie with you. It's it lies with the person who's been empowered to make the decision. Yeah. They may not be the smartest, they may not be the right person, but they gotta make the decision. Yeah. So do you spend all your time stressing about it? You don't have any control over it. Sure, try and influence it. Make your best effort to influence it. But you're not going to make the decision. So let it go. Yeah. Right? They will make the decision. And this is this is a big thing with, with how we try to influence our partners and so on. Yeah. Um, and actually, this morning I was talking to a client and he was telling me about how he tries to make his wife do more entrepreneurial stuff and she just couldn't care less. He's an entrepreneur. Yeah. And he's like, oh, you could do this. Why didn't you make something? And she doesn't. Yeah. And it's her decision to make. You know, and you're stressing about it. Of course you want the best for her. But you're not really thinking about her. You're thinking about what you think is the best for you. Right. Let her make a decision. She got control. Yeah. Right? Don't stress about that. Yeah. I can I can relate to that 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 client of yours because um uh my my wife is uh is is an engineer um i mean she's a professor but you know she does a lot of work in computer science and and a lot of the things she works on in my mind i think my god if that is a business <laughs> was sorted you know like, <laughs> but, but, but then at the same time you know it just it doesn't inspire her you know research you know cre create create creating something out of nothing teaching these things inspire her and i suppose you have to let let it be right you know at yeah. the end of the day it's what makes people happy yeah and then that's the thing it's, it's, and it's their decision to make yeah if she wants to be a lecturer she's a lecturer yeah that's good. so be it yeah. so be it exactly so what do you what is one thing someone can do today to start making better decisions um I think the probably probably a number of things that you can do. I, I think it's never a bad thing to seek out second opinions. Right? If if I'm assuming we're talking about uh a big decision or a complex decision that you need yeah. to make and you 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 have already decided that you're going to think about it and deliberate i would say yeah you want to think about the consequences and you might want to bring in a second opinion or have an outsider give you a different perspective i think but, but who would that person be well somebody that you you might trust i think it's ray dalio who says you might want to get someone uh, believable yeah. Um, somebody who's done what you're trying to do maybe th three times or something like that, or somebody who's who's done it for a while. Yeah. Um, getting a couple of opinions, not just one person, so it's not completely biased to one side. Um, so seeing things from different perspectives is not easy. Um, another simple thing is is kind of looking at things from best and worst case scenarios. It's very simple models, right? It's like what's what's the worst um, kind of what's the worst thing that could happen if we move this direction? What's the best thing that could happen if we move this direction? And what's in between? Yeah. What's happening here is basically you're prompting yourself to think, yeah. and I think anything that prompts you to think, yeah, will help you consider different perspectives. Will reveal different insights about the context and the situation. I think that will help. Right. Um, this contextual awareness is something that I think is very important for people uh, when they make a decision. And I, and I, I give an uh, example of um, 
senior client of mine. Um, he was going to be um, promoted. He was going to be promoted to a level where in Asia Pacific region, he was pretty much going to be the most senior person in the company. Um, the question then becomes, what? why did he want that role? Why did he want to be in that position? Why do you want to be promoted? Because, hey, if you don't get promoted, you don't have as much responsibility. Right. You know? So, so he, he started doing all this self in, his this introspection and this kind of self-reflection and trying to come to a conclusion of who he was and why he wanted to do that. And That's great. Self-awareness, critically important. That comes back to the idea of principles. Um, one of the things he had to do in his role is be an ambassador for the company. Right? Now... That is critical. If you look at the context of the company, that meant liaising with different regulators. It meant uh, different government bodies, clients, various people. It was expected. What's the context? What are the kind of people that you have to deal with? What's um, He looked at what was going on in the past. What had other people done before? And other people would kind of sit on panels and give their opinions or do presentations and so on. Uh, context, really important. Right. His goal was to create a good impression, but he's not a speaker. But he had to. He's a one-to-one -one person. Yeah. Right. So he had to kind of sit down with people. Um, he knew that about himself. That came from the introspection. But from a contextual perspective, he knew that he needed to be out and about, creating a good impression with all these people. It was expected. Right. Now you get those two things together. Right? You know yourself, you know the context, what is required, what is expected, right? What are the realities? Who are the players? You know, you know what's important to them. For some of these people, it's just making them feel good. Now you can start to make a decision about his strategy. Right? And the decision there, based on those his self-awareness and his contextual awareness, in his case, was to create little communities. He basically created a dinner club. Right. So the guy doesn't do presentations. He doesn't stand in front of a thousand people audience. He tries to avoid panels. If he can do them, it's a little bit more acceptable. But he really loves bringing together a group of people and having an intellectual discussion. So he, he'll go for dinner with five people at a really nice restaurant. Makes them all feel good because like, hey, you're part of this elite crowd. Yeah. And he creates an in, kind of brings up a topic and they have an intellectual discussion, which suits him. Small group. Right. He combined his self-awareness with his contextual awareness to make this decision. Yeah. Right? And so the reason I, I started with contextual awareness and the importance of that is understanding what this group needed. This group of people needed to be heard. They, they needed to feel good about themselves. They needed to be feel important. Right? He needed to be out there in front of them so that they could see him. They needed to understand who he was. Right? So all these things come into context. Yeah, and so he could combine those two things to make a decision in his his favor. That's a bit of a rambling example, but um, yeah, but it makes sense. Yeah, yeah it, it, come back to how do you make decisions? Well, you know yourself, you know the context, um, and you think about that. You know where you're going with the outcome, and then you make your decision. Yeah, I hope that made sense. It does. It okay, does. Yeah, it did. It did. Did make sense. Um, yeah, this is a very interesting conversation. I like to, I usually like to end off my, my conversation with my guests on, on something more general and more reflective. Okay. And that is, <coughs> um, what life lesson has taken you the longest to learn? And in why? relation to decision making? No, in relation <laughs> to, in relation to anything. Uh, um, Is it that a hard question? Uh, yeah, I mean, you. D the, the reason I ask is not really to like you know to search the re deep recesses of your mind, but really just to it's almost as a reflection on like, um, you know, what's what's a valuable lesson that maybe you didn't uh, appreciate quickly enough, if that's another way to put it. I think 
the idea of being intentional. Um, I think when you start off in life, and, and maybe you're only meant to learn it at a later stage, maybe you're not meant to learn it early on, but when you, especially when I think of careers and so on, you kind of, it's probably a small group that's an exception, but for many people, I think you, you're very opportunistic in the way your life goes. Um, a lot of outside factors influence how you make decisions and what path you take. But when you get to a certain stage, um, to get satisfaction out of your career, to, to make better decisions, I, I started to realize that being intentional about what I wanted to do, about who I wanted to be, uh, became uh, very important and it, it, it I, I just I guess I became more aware of the power of it and and there's probably a big trend at the moment or maybe we're at the tail end I don't um, of this whole idea of mindfulness yeah right um, and I think it 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 ties into that very much but the the whole idea of being conscious about things and what's going on but then about being intentional about how you use that. And I think that applies on so many levels. It's like, how do I wanna behave when things go wrong? How do I wanna behave when I'm pissed off? How do I wanna um, approach certain activities? Um, who do I wanna be down the line? You know, what do I wanna learn next? And those questions is like, I have to make a choice. I have to choose what I'm like, going to do. Um, who, you know, if, if I'm, how do I want to approach a certain activity? And saying, well, you know what? I'm good at numbers. I'm very analytical. Well, then how do you frame situations intentionally so that you can apply that knowledge about yourself? It's all... Being very conscious and very intentional about it, and I think that's that's been very powerful to me, not only for myself and but for my work with with clients. Yeah. yeah. And if I if I if I dare say so, maybe being intentional is probably the best decision you, you <laughs> ever <laughs> you yeah, ever exactly. made. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, yeah, I mean, and on that note, you know, before we end, you know, this was a really great conversation. I really enjoyed it. And, um, you know, I know you do a lot of coaching and, you know, yeah. for my listeners who might be interested in it, maybe you can uh, briefly describe what you do and maybe how people can get in touch. Yeah, so uh, absolutely. Um, well, you can get in touch with me either via my website or my LinkedIn page. So it's website matthewgerardo.com. Very simple. Um, so as a coach, I would say I'm a performance coach, mostly um, focused on the professional context. So it's it's less about careers, less about life coaching, and more about how do you maximize your performance within a professional context, whether it's developing skills or acquiring new skills, overcoming confidence issues, right? Um influencing relationships, maximizing the performance of a team and the and the team dynamics within that. That's that's where I come in. I come in and help work with you on the nuances and on the detail of that, saying, hey, knowing who you are, knowing what the context is, what's what what decision should we make yeah. on the strategy to move forward and achieve your outcomes. Yeah. I, that's the kind of work I do. I'm I'm very pragmatic and practical. So for me it's I love to deconstruct people and then reconstruct them so they can be their best selves and then create really practical plans so that you can get to whatever you aspire to achieve. Yeah. That's that's what I love to do. So yeah. I mean Yeah, yeah that's what I do. I mean if somebody wants to contact me and just have a conversation, love to talk to people and if I can help and we can do something together. Then awesome. Yeah. Um, not not to minimize the work you do, but it almost sounds like you're trying to make everyone the six million dollar man. You know, you know? <laughs> like, like the TV I show. Love, I, I, I get so much pleasure out of uh, you know any success that I have a kind of a small part in. Um, I give 
gives me a great sense of satisfaction. I just love watching people grow and achieve whatever it is they want to achieve. It's it's amazing. I love it. Well, Matthew, this was this was fantastic. Thank yeah, you so much pleasure. for spending time. And uh, yeah, maybe uh, if you know if there's another topic you might be interested in, I'd love to have you back <laughs> yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there will be just plenty. All right. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you. Thank mm-hmm. you.